Recreation plays an important part in the lives of Norris Dam workers. The community house contains a reading room and a lending library, as well as facilities for dancing, motion pictures, basketball, and a variety of indoor games. Then there's a post office, a chapel where ministers of various denominations hold services, and a community bank. These dormitories, now housing single workers, are also a permanent part of the town. And here's where the girls who run the cafeteria live. This cafeteria serves 3,300 well-balanced meals a day. Let's go inside. Outdoor work brings these chaps in here feeling good and hungry. There are no frills, but the helpings are generous. And look at the milk bottles. Visitors often comment on the high type of worker employed there. 350 individual houses have been built at Norris, some of brick, some of wood, one of steel, several of stone, and a large number of cinder blocks. While providing necessary houses for married workers, the authority is endeavoring to make a real contribution to the housing problems of America. The use of cinder blocks in home construction has opened new vistas in up-to-date, low-cost housing. Ordinary cinders are mixed with cement and cast into large blocks, easily laid and absolutely termite-proof. Due to the low building costs, it is possible for a man to rent a modern, well-insulated home for from $14.50 to $20.50 a month. Imagine you had only this amount to spend on rent. Could you get a house in your town like this? The authority maintains trade shops at Norris for maintenance and repair work. The shops are also trade schools where vocational training is offered the workers in their spare time. The trade unions, through the Workers' Council, which any worker is free to join, are backing the training and collaborating in the preparation of courses, and in some cases, even initiating new ones. About two-thirds of the force has signed up for one or more courses. The men are acquiring new skills, which will give them an added source of income when they return to their homes. Besides these, there are courses offered in ceramics, natural science, mathematics, poultry raising, dairying, and other subjects. And here are the citizens of Norris in another mood. Ranged on a shady hillside, they watch some of their fellows competing in an impromptu holiday sports meet. Norris knows what all work and no play does to Jack, and to Jill too, for that matter. At a plant such as Wheeler, power is generated in proportion to the amount of water flowing. When the river is high, much power can be developed. When it is low, little is available. It is during the dry periods that the water stored in Norris Reservoir, several hundred miles away, will be released, generating power up there, and again and again, as it passes each run of river plant, such as Wheeler. Now let's get down into that cofferdam and watch the drillers pave the way for a blast which will loosen tons and tons of rock from the riverbed. For this particular blast, 100 holes were drilled. Seldom does anyone,
except a construction engineer, ever an opportunity to witness operations of this kind so close at hand. Compressed air blows the drilled holes clean. Then comes the dynamite. This man is known as a powder monkey. His job is to insert the electric fuses into sticks of dynamite. It's ticklish work and calls for a steady hand and plenty of nerve. Then the stick with the fuse in it is lowered into the hole and rammed home. Go easy there, fella. That's dynamite. Sand is poured in and tamped down. And the hundred wires led into the central switch. Electric shovels begin clearing up immediately after the blast. The rock is loaded into trucks and rolled away. Meanwhile, the U.S. Army engineers have built a navigation lock on the opposite bank of the river. The lock will have a lift of 53 feet. Sand and gravel for Wheeler Dam is obtained from the riverbed. These buckets bring up aggregate and drop it into a screening plant aboard the dredger, where it is sifted into assorted sizes and poured into separate barges, which are then towed upstream to the Wheeler site and moored alongside the floating cranes and concrete mixers employed on this job. In the absence of rail connections, all material and equipment comes to Wheeler by water from Wilson Dam. A crane lifts great buckets full of gravel and drops the aggregate into a batcher, such as the one at Norris, except that the batcher and the mixer are mounted on a steel barge. When mixed, the concrete is poured into drop-bottom buckets. Another crane swings this bucket out over the cofferdam to the point where the concrete is to be deposited. Forms have been prepared. Steel reinforcing rods are waiting to be embedded in the concrete. Over 600,000 cubic yards will be required to complete Wheeler Dam early in 1936. The bucket deposits its load, and the crane goes back for more.
Cheap phosphate is of vital importance in the control of soil erosion. In this field, erosion has already set in. And here's what happens when erosion is left unchecked. The topsoil is gone and the land is destroyed. Millions of acres have already been lost. There is no time to lose. One method of arresting the growth of gullies is the building of a series of check dams, and an extensive program of this nature is already underway. Another method recently worked out by TVA foresters is to spread brush matting over the gully slopes, stake it down with a tangle of wires, and sow grass seed through the matting. Where erosion has barely started, broad terracing will save the land. Fifty counties already have their terracing units at work in the valley area, and more are coming in all the time. A terracing crew with tractor and scraper will check the beginnings of erosion at a cost to the farmer of from $1.50 to $2 per acre. The tractor follows the contour lines laid out beforehand by engineers. A broad swath is cut, extending clear across the field. Then the second cut is made, some 20 feet downhill from the first. These two cuts mark the boundaries of the terrace. The beauty of this method lies in the fact that no topsoil is wasted. Crops can be grown up and over each terrace. Since the terrace follows contour lines, the rain is caught and held. Four cuts complete a terrace, and the fourth and final cut reveals the finished ridge, a stout barrier against the downward rush of torrential rainwater, bent upon the complete and irrevocable destruction of a fertile field. And here's a finished field with one, two, three, four broad terraces across it, saving this land for all time. <laughs> Let's follow this line across the hills to Tupelo, Mississippi, the first city to contract for TVA power. The main street, the courthouse, 
the city hall and the mayor and city clerk reviewing figures showing that with power costing an average of 55% less than it formerly did, sales increased 126% in less than a year. Residential users are learning more of the blessings of electricity. Tupelo is not the only city to profit through lower power bills. For instance, in Athens, Alabama, this consumer's last bill under the old rate showed he paid $10.35 for 177 kilowatt hours. And look at his bill for TVA power. Meanwhile, from substations such as this, the Tennessee Valley Authority is pushing lines into rural communities. Thousands of counties in America have never enjoyed the benefits of electricity. Linemen from the Alabama division are bringing with them the medium that will lighten the drudgery of housework and permit wider use of man's greatest natural resource, the power that lies in the might of a river. Now the cross arm swings into place and the insulator is securely fastened. The line must be tied in firmly so that high winds and winter storms may not interrupt the delivery of cheap TVA kilowatts to farms and homes. The power policy of the Tennessee Valley Authority states clearly that the business of generating and distributing electric energy is a public business. Private and public interests in the business of power are of different kind and quality and should not be confused. The interest of the public in the widest possible use of electricity is superior to any private interest. Where this private interest and this public interest conflict, the public interest must prevail. If this conflict can be reconciled without injury to the public interest, such reconciliation should be made. But the right of a community to own and operate its own electric plant is undeniable. This is one of the measures which the people may properly take to protect themselves against unreasonable rates. But low rates alone are not enough. Through its agency, the Electric Home and Farm Authority, the TVA is making possible a wider use of electricity through a broader use of electric appliances. The Electric Home and Farm Authority does not sell a single appliance, but it cooperates with manufacturers, with retail dealers, and with utilities to bring low-cost, high-grade equipment into homes on long-term payment plans. Electric ranges, electric water heaters, electric pumps, electric refrigerators, and a host of other electric appliances have been mobilized not only to ease human burdens, but to help lift the depression by providing employment for untold thousands of workers in manufacturing plants throughout the land. The meter is installed. Times are changing. New ways are replacing the old. In hundreds of ways, the tireless energy of electric power is wiping out traditional drudgeries. Let us contrast for a moment yesterday with today and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. 